you know, I, I think a lot of people who finally get to the end of the road and are on top of the mountain look back and say, you know, that wasn't easy, but it was absolutely worth it. And, you know, the, the fulfillment and gratifying feeling at the end, I think is completely worth going through the frustrations that come with, you know, a lot of the adversity that life has to handle. This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneur, and I am so excited. I got Jake Olson here, author, motivational speaker, uh, you know, super unbelievable football star in your category. Uh, most people don't know, but Jake Olson was the long snapper at USC. But more importantly, I think uh, everyone in the world, Jake, has disabilities. You know, I always tell people I'm at literally a huge disadvantage than most people because I hide my disabilities better than anyone because I'm completely screwed up on the inside. Uh, but you can't see, you know, and it's pretty obvious unless your future so bright, you're wearing shades in here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> looks like they're the same sunglasses from your book, Open Your Eyes. They're getting a little small, buddy. So I know, buy some new I know. Ones. We, we're, we're working now that I'm outside of the uh, NCAA's grasp on, uh, on some deals. So maybe a sunglass. Yeah, yeah I got some up. connections with Maui Jim. There we go, yeah. yeah I guess, no, hey. Not that the polarization would help, but it, they're good, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, you know, you were able to see uh, with at least one eye until you were almost 12. Is that right. correct? Yes, yeah. Um, you know, had my left eye taken at one, then obviously grew up with my right eye. And it was varying uh, degrees of eyesight, even in my right eye. I mean, there's sometimes, depending on what we're doing with treatment-wise, that I could... Barely see on my right eye, or see pretty good on my right eye at some point. So, but eventually lost that eye at the age of twelve. Did you ever feel sorry for yourself? Uh, no, I didn't feel sorry for myself in the sense that I was like, you know, I, I, you know, why can't other kids go through this, or why, why me necessarily? I mean, obviously there was questions of, you know, when the cancer returns, you know, eight times, it's kind of like, okay, like why, like why can't we beat this? Why isn't this working? Um, obviously it was hard to comprehend when eventually the cancer came back when I was 12 and they said we had to take out the eye. Why couldn't we continue to fight it with something? Um, you know, we, we did run out of options, but so there was, there was obviously questions, but I never did. I never did. I, you know, point fingers or, or feel like somehow it was necessarily unfair. I mean, it was obviously I was different and in that I came with more struggles, but I also was, you know, presented with a lot more opportunities the next kid. And I just capitalized on them. What sports did you play uh, up until you lost all your your, your eyesight? You know, I, I played uh, basketball. I was, was kind of always tall, so I was a pretty good basketball player. I was a decent soccer player growing up. I, I actually liked playing soccer a lot. Um, baseball, I played baseball. However, I was a right-handed batter, and again, I lost my left eye at the age of one, so I didn't have much peripheral vision. <laughs> yeah. So I literally... I don't think I was picking up the ball like other kids were. So I, I, and pitchers are obviously wild when you're a kid. So I got like beamed in the face a little too many times oh, and it was shit. like, you know, that's probably not the sport for me. So definitely didn't play baseball more than like probably two or three years. Um, loved playing golf, loved playing football. I tried water polo. Um, I had an Australian coach. He tried to explain how to do the egg beater, but I, he, it was like, I, be a, like, some of like so I didn't know what the heck he was saying. I was like a you know ten year old, so I'm like, I have no idea. So that didn't last more than a couple of weeks. Um, but you know, loved to surf. Grew up in Huntington Beach, obviously. So you know, water, the ocean was kind of my realm a little bit more than the next guy. But you know, obviously after I went blind, I, my two biggest passions were football and golf, and I continued playing. That's awesome. And how did you decide long snapping would be your gift? Well, because I started playing golf after I lost my eyesight immediately and had to, you know, obviously rebuild my swing and rebuild my talents on the course. You know, I went from a 12 year old who was decent at playing golf to a 12 year old who couldn't make contact anymore. So, you know, starting with golf, it was all muscle memory. It was all feel. It was, you know, feeling my body in every shot, understanding, you know, what was happening. Uh, And so I didn't play and I, I continued to center it for my flag football team my eighth grade year. So I kind of obviously just knew how to center a ball, you know, just one hand, just hike it back to three yards to the quarterback. And it was kind of easy to replicate, but didn't play my freshman or sophomore year at my high school because it just was tackle football at a high level. Didn't think there was a position, you know, I couldn't play center anymore as, you know, you need to call out like where the Mike linebacker is and all this other stuff <laughs> that, you know, doesn't necessarily work if you can't see. But I wanted to continue to play and so end of my sophomore year came upon the log snapping position and the same thing like golf it's 
okay, you're snapping the ball at eight yards or 15 yards, and it's like the same motion, same, you know, variables, the same everything consistent. Just get the feel down, get the muscle memory down, be in tune with your body and your movements, and just repeat it over and over again. And that's how I kind of came upon long snapping in the sense that golf actually trained probably that part of my mind that allowed me to then replicate the motion of snapping over and over again. So a lot of people have to overcome things in their lives, and, you know, this is an obvious one. Uh, what lessons... Right, we talk about in your book, uh, open your eyes. But what lessons have you learned through this process? Well, you know, I, I I learned that through just going blind and living with cancer and things. Is that you know, obviously, number one, it is your choice as a, a human and your choice as an individual. If you want to overcome adversity, that's your first step. Is is having that mindset. Um, you know, I always say if there's a will, there's a way. Meaning, just because you go blind, just because something happens to you, um, you know because you might not be as smart as the next guy or creative or whatever doesn't mean you have to you know forfeit your hopes and dreams or not do the things you love it just means you have to work harder or find a different way of doing it you know I wanted to continue to play golf and football and sure I'm not going to be the star quarterback out in the field or a star tight end but I can still participate and still play the game I love as a long snapper um, so it's kind of adjusting those those dreams and continue to do the things you love not letting that adversity stop you and knowing that like my favorite lesson in my book anyways is finding the setup and the setback that in every setback there's a setup waiting to happen and the only way you see that setup is through per patience and perseverance um, but you know it absolutely is promised and it will come and what do you most enjoy about that consistent persistent process you know living to your potential I, I always say you know I grew up with nothing and I feel sorry for the kids that have everything because no matter what I do you know, it's extraordinary, right? I can always say, oh, I came from nothing. Oh my God, really? You know, for you too, right? Yeah. Just playing golf or long snapping, you know, whereas, you know, you can't see me, but I'm five seven, played college football and I just sucked. Um, I was on the average division three football player, so I had no excuses, right? But, you know, do you see an advantage, right? Of here, I have a disability, so, you know, now I can motivate people, I right. can inspire them, and, and you're taking advantage of it all. Yeah, no, and, and absolutely, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for all the, the opportunities and blessings that have come in my life because of, you know, obviously going going blind and, and battling cancer, I understand that, that's what I'm talking about, you know, the setup and in, in those um, setbacks is incredible. We're still seeing it, but no, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, I say everyone has excuses and the difference between the successful people and the non successful people is if you use those excuses to cheapen yourself and, you know, use them not to get somewhere, then you're absolutely not going to get there. But if, if you don't, then you push through and it's, it's tough, but you know, I, I think a lot of people who finally get to the end of the road and are on top of the mountain look back and say, you know, that wasn't easy, but it was absolutely worth it. And you know, the, the fulfillment and gratifying, feeling at the end I think is completely worth going through the frustrations that come with you know a lot of the adversity that life has to handle now you mentioned patience and one of the things that I have difficulty uh, because I've had to work hard you know come overcome a lot of setbacks in my life as well and I can I love that I call them all the time it's just a setup I'm living in God's favor I just don't see the whole picture this right. is just a piece of the puzzle you know I, I go to my son's he's nine his baseball game and the ball's hit to the shortstop and it like nicks off the kid's knee, drops right in front of him and he has a force out at second base. And instead of just like tossing the ball to second base, he like grabs his leg like it has fallen off, lies on the ground crying. And I, I, you know, I don't know if it's my perception as a, a 51 year old man, but I feel that a lot more kids, it wasn't just that that kid's soft. Right, it, it it wasn't. That didn't really bother me. Well, maybe what it would was. bother me, <laughs> yeah. What really bothered me was when I played, and I played shortstop. If that ever happened, one, the coach was yanking me. Yeah. Two, probably calling me names, which may or may not be appropriate. But moreover, the other kids on the team yeah. aren't respecting me. Right. 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 They're not coddling me, going, "Oh, you know, is your knee okay, Dave?" They're like screaming at me. You know, and when right. I get in the dugout, they may be beating me up, which may or not be okay. But do you feel sometimes you lose your patience with people going, are you literally whining about that? You know, I think everyone has their own adversity and everyone, you know, to their own extent has, you know, I'm, look, some people deal with adversity different ways. Where I get frustrated is when people start forfeiting on their worth in life and not listening to you know, what I call like their winner within or, you know, making excuses. One of my coaches says, you know, ex all excuses are is you cheapening yourself. Right on. You know, and so I think I get frustrated when people settle for those excuses when they're saying, you know, 
and they point at society saying, well, they can't, you know, they're making fun of me. They can't, you know, they're telling me I can't do something. It's like, okay, yeah, that might be legitimate. And yeah, people are going to say, but guess what? That happens to everyone. You know, again, everyone has an excuse and some are legitimate more than others, but everyone has an excuse. And it's really then at, at that point up to you if you're going to use that excuse or not. So where I get frustrated with people is where, you know, all they can do is focus on the excuse where they play that victim. It's like, okay, I understand this is legitimate. I understand that this isn't easy for you and you will have to work harder than the next person. But it's the only way where you can get to your potential in life because you still have potential. You still have value, you still have worth. So you're going to have to work harder than the next person. But that's at the end of the day, that's going to be the more satisfying route than sitting at home saying, well, I'm going to point fingers at him or her and find excuses, you know, and that's where I kind of get frustrated with people. Now, were you born, I believe people are born like an old soul with just this feeling in them, or did you have mentorship from your parents or Coach Carol or others in your life where these lessons or wisdom, because you're still young, yeah, right? You have a lot of wisdom for someone so young, and you had it when you were 12. I mean, you were fired up talking to people when you were 12 and you lost your sight and had cancer again. You know, is, it, is this something you were born with, or <laughs> do you have some mentors along the way? I don't know. I guess I've always been told I had a little bit of old soul, and you know, I think I've, I was born stubborn. But I think a lot of it obviously is just going through cancer as a young child, knowing, you know, it's when I could understand it eventually as a child, what I was going through. And, you know, a lot of it was, you know, being persistent, not taking it lightly, not, you know, pretending like it's the end all be all, making sure I still had a, a sense of humor and, you know, could smile at the end of the day. Um, but no, I mean, my parents obviously were there for me. They pushed me. I, you know, I have a twin sister named Emma. She never gave me any slack. You know, she, she always made sure I, I was working hard as the next person. Um, and I do think Coach Carroll, absolutely, when I was going blind around 12, being around a man like that who, you know, his, his philosophy is always compete and win forever and, you know, never give up and, you know, all the messages he preaches, um, I think really did actually impact me as a kid. You know, someone who was successful in winning and seeing his, his you know, mental uh, outlook on life. You know, I, I think that definitely rubbed off. I mean, his right-hand man, Ben Malcolmson, says Coach Karen and I are like, I guess, the same person, just 50 years apart. So. <laughs> Which is awesome. Now, one of the things Coach Carroll believes in, and I do as well, is happiness, hmm. right? He coaches from a place of understanding there's a lot more to life, uh, and being happy is really, really important. Where does happiness fall in for you like, in the priority of things? You know, I think where, uh, where I get my happiness anyway is just in, in gratitude. You know, I think that when people say, you know, is there ever times you're sad or mad? It's like, of course, you know, I have a smile on my face a lot. But there, I mean, there's plenty of times in the day where I'm frustrated that I can't see or feel left out because I can't see or, you know, things are definitely harder because I can't see. Um, but and it's OK to have those feelings of anger and sadness. But where I think it, people get in trouble is when they let those feelings overwhelm their mind to where they are blinded then of what they the, of, of the blessings and the and the, the things that are in their life that they can be grateful for and so you know i when i get frustrated in those moments it's like sure i can't be playing with my friends i can't be playing Fortnite with all my friends and all they're doing is playing Fortnite right you're now you're not missing out brother Trust i know i well you know but, but, <laughs> uh, you can own an esport team with me how about that <laughs> there we go that's fun we make shitload of money off these kids <laughs> playing games well that's what i'm about oh, baby that's why, we, that's why we're sitting here um, nice. <laughs> um but you know so there's times where you feel left out but it's like at the end of the day man i still have these great friends i still have you know a capable mind i can still talk to them and joke around with them and hear them and it's just like there's so many things in my life that i can be grateful for that you know when i start in those moves i'm like you know what like it, it would be shameful for me just to sit here and focus on the one thing i don't have is my eyesight so it's okay to be sad and mad sometimes but you know you don't ever want it to envelop you to the point where you can't be grateful for the things you are I, and it's so true one of the philosophies i have is look into the darkness um too many people they search for what they want in light uh they trust their perceptions and i remember when i was in law school uh, one of the most interesting lessons I had in my very first class at criminal law is the professor started the class and some guy came in and assaulted him, punched him right in the face and knocked him over. Jeez. And everyone was like, whoa. And then you realize it was staged and he stood up and he said, okay, everybody tell me what happened. And people got their color wrong, sex wrong, what he was wearing wrong, his height wrong. And so... Uh, I believe I, I, I look for me, like the true vision in darkness. I actually will close my eyes when I think that I'm in a state of illusion, meaning things aren't what they perceive right, to right, be. Right. Uh, do you find with that philosophy, I, I know a lot of times it's frustrating. You can't play Fortnite and, you know, see when someone's like, oh, God, holy shit, look at that. <laughs> it's yeah, right. like, what? Uh, but on the other side, 
like I close my eyes and force myself to, to see things in a different way. Do you feel that you, that set up, have that advantage over some people that you actually can, you know, see through the illusions and have more of a perspective of the truth? Yeah, I think a lot of times uh, I, I definitely do. I think, you know, the old cliche, you know, judging a book by its cover or whatever you want to, you know, um, X, Y, Z that comes along with that is, yeah, I think some people can get sidetracked with what they're seeing, what's in front of them. And, um, you know, there's a lot of times where, you know, it, uh, the, I guess, uh, overall, you know, manipulation that some people have with looks or whatever doesn't affect me as much. I mean, I, I've met people where, you know, people, that's why we're friends, buddy. I know. <laughs> I'm extremely good looking. <laughs> I got a face for radio. There you <laughs> go. I know. That's what they always tell uh, me. This video stuff's killing me lately. I know. I, I, um, but no, I mean, that's the thing. You know, I just focus on what people have to say and what they do. And um, kind of to your point, one of my coaches has a, has a great saying is that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Dude, Wayne Dyer. Yeah. There, there you, you go. go. So, my favorite. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of what you're saying. You know, closing your eyes, just focusing on the different aspects of the decision or whatever you're trying to make and kind of seeing, okay, well, now I've changed the way I look at it. Does what I'm looking at change as well? So I have a funny family story about blindness because my mom and her sister married Meltzers that weren't related. Oh, wow. But moreover, <laughs> my mom's sister was set up with my uncle Eli Meltzer on a, blind, bl on a blind date by a blind man, Wayne Foster, a famous oh. musician who was blind. And so he always jokes around, I was really nervous. I literally went on a blind date. Like I'm like, what's this girl gonna look like? Uh, but anyway, I, I thought that was interesting. Okay. Is Meltzer German? Ah, uh, yeah, it means waiter. So my name actually means beloved waiter, oh. which actually through my enlightenment uh, in my quantum shift in life, uh, I shifted my whole life to be a beloved servant, to, to live my life of service to other people, which is uh, what my last question is. Well, don't get shown. <laughs> you, you, your life is a setup, and you have a, a great role, and you have great talent uh, that's being shared with people. What do you th see for your legacy, your future uh, of being of service? Obviously, you want to help a lot of people. You know, what do you see for yourself? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I obviously want to just kind of be a example. I mean, there's there's plenty of out there, but just people who you know weren't dealt the fairest hand of hand in life, who you know weren't uh, whose plans didn't go to exactly what I thought or what my family wanted or you know whatever, um, but still had the absolute decision in life and the control to do what I love, be happy, go achieve my dreams, um, show the world that you know you don't have to have eyes or this or that to to be successful um and just kind of make a new standard i mean that's that's what really i want to do in life that's what's you know i think been given to me i amazingly enough after i lost my sight like i never pursued motivational speaking or writing a book or anything it just kind of fell in place and people were kind of drawn to my story and so that's that's what it's kind of become and i think the really cool thing is you know, as, as much as I love inspiring people, you know, I don't play football solely to inspire. I don't play golf to solely inspire. I don't do a lot of these things just solely to inspire. I do them because I love to do them and I'm passionate about them. And it's just the extra benefit um, that I do get to inspire people. And I, and I just absolutely love that. Well, I can see and I wish I could play golf better and play uh, for the USC Trojans. That would have been nice. Uh, it's interesting because we could have named your book Close Your Eyes, 10 Uncommon <laughs> Lessons to Discover a Happier Life. Which I think be. might be a, be a better path. Maybe that's the sequel. Yeah, that, I think you should. Let's keep it in mind. I'll publish it for you. Uh, anyway, you are truly inspiring. And, you know, I think I love Wayne Dyer's Change the Way You Look at Things, the Things You Look at Change. And every setback is a setup. And I'm glad you're out there because a lot of kids, you know, when you're old like me, they're not going to listen. They may watch me, but they're not going to listen to me. I think it's really important for people to see, you know, stop whining. Everybody has setbacks make the most of your life you can have an extraordinary life and you help so many people and that's what i wish upon so many more young people that they can experience that to inspire others to inspire others to be happy and that's what that book's about and that's what you're all about so thanks for coming on the playbook uh, danke Herr Meltzer. ah there we go my german brother right here you have mr Meltzer with jake olson here on entrepreneurs the playbook if you've enjoyed this episode of the playbook learn more valuable lessons right over here